And just particularly for the, the uninitiated here, there may be people on the call here not familiar with who we are and what we do. We are Local Energy Scotland, a consortium of regionally based energy agencies covering the length and breadth of the country. We deliver Scottish Government's Community and Renewable Energy Scheme, often referred to as CARES. It's the, basically the one-stop shop for Scottish Government's community energy support in all shapes and sizes. I work for Energy Saving Trust. Uh, we're the lead partner consortium. I'm based in Inverness. I provide uh, support and guidance for shared ownership throughout Scotland. So just to set the scene here today, and particularly for, as I say, the uninitiated, um, just a little bit, a couple of slides about what shared ownership is, what we're going to be talking about this afternoon. And from the Scottish Government's perspective and their onshore wind policy statement, refresh uh, 2021 consultation draft from October 2021, Scottish Government's ambition for shared ownership that we also continue to encourage the renewables industry to consider, explore and offer shared ownership opportunities as standard on all new renewable energy projects, including repowering and extensions to existing projects. Mostly that now involves large onshore wind, some hydro, and uh, perhaps we're seeing the start of uh, some solar projects coming into this space as well. So just a little bit more about what shared ownership actually is. And again, this is from Scottish Government's guidance, Scottish Government good practice principles for shared ownership of onshore renewable energy developments. That's a document that uh, we refer to quite a lot for guidance in this matter. And again, that can be found through Local Energy Scotland's website and Scottish Government website as well. It defines shared ownership at its highest sort of level as any structure which involves a community group as a financial partner over the lifetime of a renewable energy project. And I think the easiest way of maybe understanding that is in one of the one of the models, perhaps a joint venture where a community organization would own shares in the wind farm uh, company. And that's what we're going to look at that particular model in more detail this afternoon. So, yeah, community shared ownership in Cross Dykes Wind Farm. We're going to look at this project as pretty much a case study this afternoon. And this deal involved Muir Hall Energy Limited, uh, the developer of the wind farm, Cross Dykes Community Benefits Limited, and uh, their subsidiary Services Limited, representing the community organization involved in the deal. Uh, community Renewable Energy Scheme, CARES, who provided legal and financial advice, grants for, for that advice. Uh, we're also involved in the deal from uh, a relatively early stage was the Energy Investment Fund, no longer no longer in existence. Now that's the Scottish National Investment Bank um, who provided some loan advice. And the project involved 5% shares owned by the community in the 46 megawatt project or 2.3 megawatts of community shared ownership. The project, the shared ownership project was agreed and completed uh, May 2022, and this also involved a CARES grant for a community action plan, which is there to ensure good outcomes for the community from the proceeds of that shared ownership stake. So, delighted to introduce three speakers this afternoon. We're hoping that uh, if Nick Jennings is available and managed to log in from a far location this afternoon, but very keen to be involved in this discussion and to give the community perspective in this deal. We also have, I'm delighted to have uh, Sarah McIntosh, the Managing Director for Muir Hall Energy, uh, again to give a uh, perspective, this time the developer perspective on this deal. And finally, last but not least, we have Andrew Wilkinson, partner at, in Financial Advisors, QMPF, who were involved in providing the ultimately the financial advice to the community to allow them to make an informed decision on this shared ownership opportunity. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over. Ah, fantastic. I see Nick Jennings there. Nick, 
Good afternoon to you. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> we're live and online here just now, so uh, we're seeing you. You're, you're a little, little bit uh, pixely, but all the same, we're, I think we can hear you. And uh, if you'd like to start to tell us a bit about the community's perspective in the cross dikes, okay. deal, yeah. please. Thanks, Nick. Please. That's great. Can, can you hear? Can you hear me and see me clearly? Yes. Yeah, because I'm talking to you from um from my car, <laughs> from my car here. Uh, I'm very very in the um, location, and I had a little difficulty logging on. But um, yeah, basically, I'd, I'd like to give you a little bit from the community perspective, and it's a very subjective um, explanation. But I think it, I, I looked at really sort of five five aspects. I looked at what what I call planning or research and development, and that and really asking the questions, why do we want to own a share? Uh, and why does the developer want to give us a share? And why does the Scottish government want us to have a share? And I think some of those things might have been, might have been covered in the, in the rest of the conference. But I think the interesting thing about a share is that it, it give, gives um, a way of bringing um, different people and different visions together. I think that was a strong point of interest for myself. Uh, I think at this stage of looking at share ownership, it's full of a lot of creative potential and can be very unifying and can bring different interests around um, a common shared purpose. But I think if I'm honest, um, you know, from my own perspective, I'd much prefer to see, um, you know, full communal share ownership in the generation and distribution of electricity through nationalization. But putting that aside, offered share ownership by, by the developer early on. And we weren't really clear what we were getting into. And I think that's you know going to be an issue for quite a lot of communities. As you know, share ownership still isn't that universal in the UK. And understanding exactly what, what a share is, what this means, what the um, potential is and, and what the risks are, were, were questions that really exercised those who were part of the group who were offered the share. But with the help of CARES and the help of the experts and the help of the developer, we were able to get a, clear, a clearer picture of what we were getting into. But I think it's very important to know what, what you're getting into. And I think it's difficult for people to get their heads around that, certainly subjectively. And from my experience, uh, it was difficult to, to, to get a grasp of what it meant to own a share. But looking at it more simplistically, it was another source of revenue and another opportunity for the community and for community, community development. We were five different communities. And I think one of the issues we had is we weren't unified by any common, common vision. Uh, some, some of the communities had a vision of what they wanted to do, what they wanted to, um, achieved through share ownership and some didn't have any at all and there was quite a lot of doubt um suspicion what are we being offered why are we being offered it how do we how do we pay for it what are the risks involved we had to pull together um and develop some some leadership we had good leadership really from from the developer they put a lot of effort into um making the proposition as clear as they could. And various members of the community got involved with exploring that. But this was done over quite a long period of time. And that's been an issue in itself is, is um, finding and maintaining um, leadership throughout the period of exploring the, the, the offer. And that really leads on to the issue for, for our own communities and remote rural communities is, is the difficulties of organizing and the human resources that, that are involved. Who's doing the job? Who, who's making this happen? Um, it can be a lot of volunteer effort over a prolonged period of time. Um, on the positive side, in most communities, you'll find people that are willing to stick their heads above the parapet the doers and makers and, and give it a go. And we were fortunate in having those people within our, our five communities. Um, they were recruited through 
community councils, and that was who the you know original offer was made to, made to community council. Whether that's in the long run and in, in retrospect, whether that's the appropriate um, bodies to be dealing with with share ownership is, is quite interesting. And as you know, we had to develop a whole new organization um, to, to deal with the issue of um, share ownership. So on the plus, I think it's important to spend more time in the beginning clarifying how you're going to um, engage in, in share ownership. I think one of the challenges is if you haven't got a clear understanding, and I think for most people, this was a new thing, there wasn't a clear understanding, then how do you engage with the, with the wider community? How do you engage with those you represent and how do you sell them the idea of, of share ownership? And that presented, that presented some challenges. Again, simplistically, you're saying, here's, here's, another, here's another opportunity, here's another source of, source of funding for community assets, community projects, community developments. Moving on to looking at collating, analyzing, and sharing information. That's a, a very, very important part of, the, part of the process. And again, it's something that needs, I think, more time and more energy um, put into it. And the challenges we faced was, this took place over quite an extended period of time. One of the challenges we faced from being a diverse range of communities is some people understood or thought they understood what the offer was and some didn't. Some were more risk averse than others. Some anticipated um, challenges. And again, that's where the CARES funding and the CARES expert help was extremely, extremely valuable. Setting up an organization to, to service the whole process is important. And I think in retrospect, if you, if you have an existing organization, a, a development organization, a development group with a, with a paid worker, um, then that could make the process easier from the community's perspective. Um, but we've, we've now established an organization, we've bought a share and we're distributing community benefits. So, you know, in a nutshell, it's durable and can be done. Great to have the, the financial the care funding to developer who's been keen promote. It's been a, a positive experience. You're breaking up a bit there, Nicholas. That, uh, unfortunately, that's the best bit. Hope you don't get blown away there. That'd be terrible. But I think you were complimenting CARES and Muir Hall for our efforts, which is uh, fantastic. Gratefully appreciated. <laughs> yeah, I, I was complimenting you for your effort, but note, noting that it is, it is quite a lot of effort, and it's been a lot of effort for a dedicated group of, of volunteers. And there have been some moments, uh, certainly, I, you know, this is subject of experience when you, when you're thinking, what the hell am I getting into? I'm putting all this time and energy into this and, and, and what's the outcome gonna be? And I think that's where having a strong and unifying vision, knowing what you want to achieve by being a share owner. And that's not, from my perspective, not just, not just a monetary gain. It's been about the significance and the need to decarbonize the economy, to be part of that, to be promoting that. Um, and to be supporting that process, as well as the you know the sustainable goals and outcomes for the community. That's great, uh, Nick. Thanks very much for that. That's really really good stuff. And a lot of information in there. I'm trying to think if I can uh, uh, say a little at the end about what we're doing to address those. Uh, those points, you know, through our work and what we've learned from Cross Dykes. So, so hopefully we can uh, put some sense in that as well at the end. I'm sure we will. So Nick, thanks for that for, for just now. If you can hang in with us and uh, we'll go over to Sarah uh, from your hall. 
um, to give us the developer perspective on uh, on how the deal went. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Mark. Um, hello and good afternoon to you all. Uh, I am Sarah McIntosh, Managing Director here at Muirhall Energy. If you can just bear with me a second while I figure out how to work the system and <laughs> share my slides with you all. Here we are. OK, hopefully, um, oh, it's skipped ahead. Um, so there we are. Thank you. So a lovely picture there um, when construction started at Cross Dykes uh, Wind Farm, which is based down in Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, I'd like to just thank Nick Jennings um, first and foremost, and also to, to Chris Miles as well, and to the Local Energy Scotland team. Without their leadership and dedication to the shared ownership process at Cross Dykes, I don't genuinely think we would have got there. Um, we'll touch on this later about the dedication of the local communities in which we are located, because I think that without that, you, you, shared ownership will struggle. Um, and it is going to be, or it is part of Scottish government's um, standard practice, if you like, for wind farm developers going forward. But without the buy-in from the communities, inevitably we're going to struggle. But let's go back in time and let's have a look at where Cross Dykes started and that journey that Nick, Chris and the communities in Cross Dykes uh, came on with us. So 2015 was when Cross Dykes Wind Farm shared ownership was first looked at by Muirhall Energy. We instructed our advisors, Johnston Carmichael, to present a paper on community shared ownership to the community councils benefiting from Cross Dykes Wind Farm community benefit funds. These are the annual community investment funds that are paid by the wind farm throughout the lifetime of the wind farm. Between 2015 and 2020, engagement with local or community councils and Local Energy Scotland on the shared ownership opportunity took place. Nick mentioned something earlier about distrust or why is the developer offering this? And, and I have to say that was very much um, a, a a point you know for communities it's why are you offering this to us what is it you're looking from us in return and quite frankly there wasn't or there isn't anything that we're looking for we were looking to ensure that we continued to implement our usp as a company which is to ensure that communities come along with us on our journey um, for our developments and that not only started with community investment funds, it didn't stop there, I should say. We wanted to ensure that there was a direct ownership um, in our wind farms going forward to um, ensure that there was this um, buy-in, if you like, going forward for all the communities that were there and to, to maximise the returns available to them. You know, we are in these local authority, uh, local areas, sorry, for, for 25 plus years. Were tenants in those areas for those times or, or during those time periods and for us it's important as a company that we don't just pay the landowner we don't just pay community investment funds that the communities come along with us on that journey and become part of the wind farm itself so to minimize risk to the community the opportunity would not crystallize at cross sites in any event until the wind farm was operation operational and generating i'll come back to that in a little while in may 2021 cross Dykes wind farm construction was completed and the wind farm was commissioned may 2022 cross Dykes community services limited which is a subsidiary of Cross Dykes Community Benefits Limited, the company that's in receipt of annual community investment funds from Cross Dykes Wind Farm, successfully acquired a 5% shareholding in Cross Dykes Wind Farm with funding from Muirhall Energy Limited. Again, a point I'll come to in a little while. In August 2022, and this is in the public domain, Cross Dykes Community Services Limited has sold its five or sold its five percent shareholding in Cross Dykes Wind Farm, along with the other shareholders, and this has resulted or will result in a circa 30 percent return on its investment. Now that's from May 2022 to August. Um, I'm sure Nick won't mind me saying that we did give the community the opportunity to stay in the, um, the the wind farm. But of course, by divesting of its shareholding, it, it, this return that it's had on its investment gives it a significant capital injection that it can take forward, 
hopefully for our next projects in the area for for uh, for cross uh, sorry for community shared ownership or indeed for other local community projects if that's the the, the vision that the community um company wants to take forward shared ownership so why be involved well directly supports the transition to net zero take an active interest in a local wind farm and maximise the potential financial returns directly from the wind farm to the local community. The support of transition to net zero is becoming an increasingly hot topic within the media, within society. And I think that all communities will continue to have that discussion and how they can get involved in that and not just be a passive onlooker um, to these wind farms that come up in their landscape, but actually take that active interest and ownership within those wind farms to show that they are also contributing to that transition to net zero and the pride that they can take in that too when they're speaking to their children, grandchildren or whomever. How is it different? Well, most wind farms only pay a fixed amount per annum to local communities as community benefit. Shared ownership allows the community to receive community benefit funds and or plus a percentage of the wind farm profits. If the wind farm is more profitable in the future, for example, if there's higher than expected electricity prices, as we've seen recently, the community will share in any windfall profits via distributions from the wind farm or as Crossex Community Services Limited has done through the um, sale of their 5% shareholding, which has seen a slight uplift. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, um, we were prudent in terms of our financial planning for cross dikes and secured power purchase agreements that were slightly lower than the price or significantly lower, but still um, profitable uh, in terms of the current market pricing. So how does it work? Well, the wind farms constructed, connected and generates electricity. The community company buys shares in the company that owns the wind farm. The wind farm annual profits, the income from sale of electricity minus the cost of operating the wind farm for the lifetime of the wind farm are passed on to all the shareholders, including the community company. The community company that owns the shares allocates their net share of the wind farm annual profits to various local projects or in the way that they see fit. The community company has full autonomy from Muir Hall Energy's developments to use the funds from their shares in the wind farm and community benefit that is paid per annum by the community for the community in the community. We don't set limits on what they do. They're only confined in terms of their own constitution, which we don't set up. And um, that's very much for the communities to do in their local areas. So lessons learned, um, I did say I was going to touch on a couple of points that I raised earlier. So the first is that Muir Hall Energy began engagement on shared ownership with the local communities in 2015. The opportunity was the first um, in a subsidy free wind farm in Scotland. It presented a challenge as there was no subsidy to rely upon. So the renewables obligation, of course, had been removed by then. And this was and, and I think will continue to be a difficult hurdle for risk averse communities to overcome. Muir Hall Energy engaged our advisors to prepare robust financial models to provide evidence that the wind farm would provide sufficient returns on a subsidy fee project, project to comfortably repay debt. This would be the wind farm's project finance and the community debt relative to its acquisition, but also provide returns throughout the lifetime of the wind farm subject to general risk caveats. A lesson learned here for us as a developer is to encourage community advisors to join earlier in that process. I think Nick will agree with me that when it came to cross dikes, we were trying to set up the corporate structure or assist with the set up of the corporate structure and, and explore that with the communities at the same time as trying to understand how this would be um, or how the, the actual shareholding would take place, what was the best way to do it. Whereas now that we've done this, we know that the model works and therefore we would be implementing or certainly suggesting and recommending to communities that they implement a, a similar corporate structure to the one that's been achieved at Cross Dikes. To try and achieve the successful completion of a shared ownership opportunity, it is recommended that the developer and the local communities commence dialogue in three fundamental areas as early as possible in the process. First, as I mentioned, corporate structure. The earlier the structure is agreed and implemented, the easier it becomes to enter contracts with the wind farm for community benefit and understand the shared ownership structure. 
The second is funding. Muir Hall Energy ultimately assisted with the funding for the cross state shared ownership opportunity as other funding did not progress. If shared ownership is to become standard within the industry, new funding packages must be made available and accessible. We were able to assist with the funding to ensure we didn't fall foul of investment rules, etc. But I suppose the point for us is that, um, don't get me wrong, we were absolutely delighted to be able to assist, but there should and must be these funding packages available for, for local communities to tap into for these projects going forward. The last point I would make, and I would just again like to thank uh, Quail Monroe here, who stepped in whilst I was on maternity leave, actually, whilst this was ongoing to assist the community. Um, but the point here would be to it would be helpful to engage with advisors who can demonstrate significant experience in renewables to understand revenue streams, etc. Advisors without such experience can lead to delays in the process because ultimately they may not understand what a renewables development looks like, the revenue stream, etc. And they can actually feed into that risk averse nature or uh, risk averse attitude of communities, which really isn't helpful. Um, and I would like to just say that Quail Monroe is very much on the significant experience in renewables uh, side of things. So from your hall's experience, it's been a generally positive experience. Of course it has. We've successfully delivered alongside cross states communities a shared ownership structure that works and they have that shared ownership now. Um, obviously they've now sold it, but um, it, we can show that it works. And I am absolutely delighted to, to see it being rolled out across all of our projects uh, going forward. Um, our next ones in the area down in Dumfries and Galloway or Hopsrig and Logan Head. And we are now engaging with Cross Dykes Community Benefits Limited to discuss those um, opportunities that are available, but also in other areas where our wind farms are to be located. If there's any questions, please do ask at the end, but I hope you find that helpful. Um, and uh, like I say, happy to answer any questions. That's great, Sarah. Thanks very much for that. It's really interesting and some really useful uh, points there that uh, we'll have a think about and uh, try and uh, drill into a wee bit more at the end as well. Uh, we now move on to our final speaker, Andrew Wilkinson from QMPF, uh, referred to by Sarah there, who were eventually the financial advisors advising the community on the investment opportunity. So over to you, Andrew. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, and Sarah and Nick as well for, for your contributions there. Um, if you just bear with me, I'll just put my uh, slides on screen. So hopefully you should see these in a moment. So hopefully everybody could see that. That's perfect. Yeah, great. So yeah, thank you very much. Um, so what I'd like to do is talk about our experience on the project and, and hopefully share some lessons that we learned from um, the, the process as well and working with the, the community and with Muir Hall. So just to start with, so uh, my name is Andrew Wilkinson. I'm a partner at QMPF and I lead our energy and renewables business. Um, and for those who don't know us, just a quick background to our business. So we are a Edinburgh based financial advisory business and we specialize across uh, in the energy and renewables and, and the wider infrastructure sectors. Uh, we're a team of 17 and we're also authorized and regulated by the FCA to advise on, on projects such as this. And, and just to pick up on some examples of other recent projects that we've worked on. So we do work directly with Local Energy Scotland um, in providing sort of financial advice to help them deliver the, the CARES programme. And we work as well directly with, with community organisations like we have here on the Crosstex project to help in investment in, in renewables projects as well. Um, wider than that, we work directly with project developers and investors uh, and have done work, for instance, in raising project finance for quite a variety of onshore renewables projects. And wider than that, just in, in the space, uh, we're also a trusted advisor on the SEAI's community enabling framework, which is for the development of community owned projects in Ireland. So that gives us a little bit of a an, an extra perspective of, of how things are done differently across there and, and allows us to, to bring that to the, to the Scottish market as well. So Really what I wanted to talk about today was our involvement in the, the Crosstex project. 
and clearly we've already heard from the community and the the developer in that um and and got their perspectives on it um but i think having some like some views from us in, in terms of sort of our experience of it i think it was mentioned before that we came to the the project relatively late in the day uh, and therefore we're picking up on um discussions that already happened and um, there was already a proposal on the table um and, and discussions had already taken place and and just how we supported the community and, and the project there as well um so to sarah's point i think it would have been been helpful if we'd be involved earlier on um i think that would have made things a little bit smoother but but nevertheless i think we had two two willing parties there that wanted to do a deal so that that made things quite a lot easier than it than it certainly could have been um so just to pick up on our engagement so our role once we were engaged was to review the project so do do a evaluation of the project on behalf of the community um review and advise on the investment structure and also review and advise on the funding arrangements that were being offered to the community as well. Um, and that involved some quite close working with the community, uh, with Muir Hall and with the community's um, proposed funders as well to review some project information. And, and really that included um, these things. So it's the, the financial model, which I think at, at this point in time was, was one of the key documents, one of the key um, key pieces of information that we worked with. Um, the proposed investment structure, which largely came through the shareholders agreement and shareholder loan agreement, uh, which again were provided by Muir Hall. And then the proposed funding documents as well from the community's funders, which which initially was was set to be ETH, uh, as, as Mark mentioned before. Um, but that was that was the proposed uh, share, uh, the proposed loan to the community for investing in the project. And then our work really involved reviewing all that information um, to sit alongside the community and help and advise and support them in understanding the investment and helping them structure it to make sure it met their return, their risk and return objectives for, for investing in the, in the project. So moving on, um, don't necessarily need to go through the, the structure that, that was arrived at, because I think we, we've covered that in a little bit of detail so far. But really what I wanted to look at was some of the lessons learned that, that we uh, noticed on the project um, that I think hopefully um, uh, sort of consistent with the ones that, that, that Nick and Sarah have already mentioned. Um, and just taking those in turn. So I think firstly, the real importance of engaging early um, and notwithstanding the points that, that Nick has, has mentioned before in terms of keeping people's focus and, and being able to um, keep uh keep people sort of working towards the, the the ultimate aim i think it's important that we have sufficient time to understand or the community has sufficient time to understand the proposition and understand the um the the nature of wind farm investment or renewable energy investment as well it, it is quite important and also their ability to get the right support so whether that comes through local energy scotland or whether it comes through legal or technical or financial advice as well but hopefully by being able to have that time and being able to get the right support that hopefully addresses Nick's point as well of being able to engage internally where and that that might be through some some um, education or some some workshops um, internally within the community to make sure that everybody's um, working and, and have the same understanding of the um, of the investment that's on the table. I think the the second point and, and to some extent linked as well is is really both sides understanding their objectives and also the constraints and again early dialogue on that I think helps facilitate sort of a smoother process later on um, because it really does link into I think the third point that I want to make here as well around considering structure and sources of funding so some communities in themselves will be quite fortunate and quite lucky to be able to put their own funds into projects um, but that's not necessarily and, and probably not always going to be the case and, and certainly wasn't here. So being able to consider what that structure is, what the investment returns are, what the risk profile is, to identify what the appropriate sources of funding for a project are, I think are, are, are quite key as well. Um, and then being able to engage with funders uh, and bring them on the journey is 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 quite key in, in, in a sort of a, a smooth process and, and bringing everyone along together. I think one thing that, that we did notice uh, and, and, and came across on this project and, and others as well is um, the need to be able to have 
the community's funders and, and other funders, but in this instance, the community's funders involved in the process and being able to influence structure so it meets their needs as well. Because at the end of the day, they need to go through an internal credit process and an approvals process. So the last thing that we want to be doing is having to unpick a structure that's already there to meet the needs of um, the community's funders or, or somebody else's funders to, 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 to be able to put money into the project. Um, and just thinking then of of those those key lessons, and hopefully they, uh, I think they do tie in with with what's already been mentioned. Um, but just thinking about what that means for the project and and processes on this project and and also future projects that that we might get involved in as well. I think as part of engaging early, it is really important to share information. Um, and I mentioned the financial model before as being one of those key pieces, uh, those key documents that that are needed and and I think that that's right. Um, I think it's important though that everyone remembers that the, the financial model is a working document. It's constantly evolving and it probably doesn't get locked down until sort of financial close or until the, the wind farm actually gets built. But having said that, it can help with understanding of the project, of the cash flows, um, of the risks involved. So where that's possible sort of early sight of the model as it moves and, and and sort of keeping updated on that is is quite important for the community and its advisors to really get a grip on the risks and the cash flows involved with the project um having said that um i think it's all well and good having the model but it, it's really important as well and, and on a lot of these projects the model is going to be developed by the the developer um so to be able to support the community on understanding the model, so the inputs to the model, the outputs, what it actually means, and also being able to run sensitivity analysis on that model is, is, is important. And it's an important part of bringing the, the funders along with you as well. And I think that's something that worked really well on this pro project, this project, um, because we were able to do the work with the community to be able to support them and, and their funders, but, but get the support from your hall and its advisors in terms of running that model and running sensitivities and being able to feed into the, the, the analysis that we needed to do. So again, yeah, something that worked very well on this project. I think that's probably the key information or the key things around information requirements is really access to that, that financial model and, and the support around it. But I think there's another another thing that's quite important as well in terms of thinking about these processes and, and making sure that, that they're smooth. And that's really understanding the timescales. So I think one thing here, it's important on one hand for the community to remember that they need to be working uh, with the developer to fit into that commercial process that the developer is going through. So the developer may have um, deadlines and, and, and a timeline that it's trying to, to hit. But equally well, on the other side, the developer needs to remember that communities might need more time than com other commercial investors, either to understand the information or to be able to, to make decisions based on what, what they're getting. So that really needs to, to factor into the, the timescales. And, and I think harks back to the, the, the point on engaging early and making sure that all that is built in. Um, and then when thinking about those, those timelines, I mean, on the, on the community, I think it's important they make sure that they're supported, that they understand that they have the right team around them to be able to help make decisions and fit those timelines and not hold the developer up on, on that commercial process that it's going through. But also developers um, being able to assist with the analysis and support that, that, that they can provide the community to help them meet the meet those meet those timelines. And again, I think that's something that worked well here. Um, it felt like there was a, a really good working relationship between both sides um of two parties that really wanted to do a deal together so so could help one another out on that front um and the last point really that i wanted to make and and i think this ties into a point that nick mentioned before on on leadership and resource within the community and that's being able to make decisions so i think it's it's really important that the community can make the decisions and and that it can review the information that it has and it can review the um the advice that it's getting from its advisory team but it is one thing having that information and reviewing it but it's another thing making a decision of that of that so having a process in place um 
that everybody understands is is quite important and that could be done i think in different ways so it could be done by nominated representatives or through meetings but i think whichever way it's done um what we need to make sure is that it's understood by everybody so everybody can work to that and provide the right things at the right time so the community can make appropriate decisions to feed into that that wider process and again although we were only involved towards the the latter stages of the the project here i think it's something that, that certainly from our perspective worked, worked quite well that we we had the right access to the right people and we were able to to get the, the decisions we need to hopefully move the move the project along so very conscious that was probably a quite a quick canter through some of the um uh some of the information and, and requirements and the lessons that, that i think we learned were from working on this project but i'll hand back to to mark but very happy to take questions in the in the q a session afterwards thank you that's great thanks very much for that andrew again a lot of uh, useful information there and very interesting as well and i'm just thinking about how to try and maybe tie these things together and i thought i might uh, just let everyone know what we're doing in our process, uh, you know, as briefly as I can, taking those kind of learning experiences on board, having been part of that uh, development to a large extent, supporting the community and working with the developer and funders and advisors throughout the last, certainly the last four years that I've been involved here. Um, yeah. R really relevant points about uh, appetite for risk from the community and understanding what shared ownership is. I think that's uh, you know a fundamental point at the very outset of a project and at the earliest stage. Um, it's good to see shared ownership introduced into the consultation phase of a pre-consented wind farm project typically. And at that stage, it's often helpful that ourselves at Community Energy Scotland can uh, perhaps uh, present for an hour or so to the community just to set the scene for what shared ownership is in an educational sort of sense um, and what the care support is and what's available to that community. Otherwise, uh, there's a, a risk that communities will miss out on the opportunity either through misunderstanding or lack of understanding of what is actually being offered and also suspicions mentioned as to the motives behind these things. I think we have an impartial role and we're often asked along to these early engagement, community engagement exercises and events to give that sort of help in an impartial way to communities. And yes, at that early stage, we've learned that uh, it's really important to get advisors on board. Now, typically, uh, there's legal work to be done and legal advisors will be called in to give some guidance on early documentation, legal documents like uh, a memorandum of understanding, which can be an early stage document, just setting out the scenes and the, uh, the high level aspirations for the project. Um, financial advice at that stage is very is uh, on the actual project is very thin on the ground of course until the project's consented and uh, final investment decision can be made from realistic numbers and that may be years down the line so what we've done and what we're actually speaking with uh, andrew and qmpf about now is coming in with some events at an early stage to provide some more general uh, kind of educational information about risks, about investing um, and about investing in wind farms. So we'll, we will try and introduce that uh, from now. And as I say, we're going to finalise those arrangements in the next few weeks and we we'll hopefully uh, be able to introduce that into some up and coming projects, perhaps with Muir Hall as well. And Yes, the funder, uh, getting a funder, a potential funder involved at an early stage, particularly when developers, understandably at this early stage in the development of this sector, they don't have um, off the shelf uh, sort of models for delivering shared ownership. Muir Hall are, uh, are ahead of the pack in this regard, of course, with Cross Dykes and uh, some other projects in development as well. But there are many other developers, dozens of other developers coming along with dozens of their own projects and uh, we have to work with them and support them to develop their models and to speak to funders so as a matter of course now we introduce uh, the scottish national investment bank as that potential gap funder 
to work with the community and to do some of the heavy lifting for the community in the complicated and technical uh, legal arrangements with uh, with communities and developers. Often that involves developers first and foremost. They have the gift of what the model can or can't be from their own perspective and their own um, ambitions for their project. But again, we also have uh, Andrew and his QMPF team available at that stage as a more of a, a broader brush approach to um, a range of potential funders. So we can start to look at that. We're going to try and introduce that um, and the discussion with QMPF and the community at an, the earliest possible stage. So that's all in development and all learned from this experience. And, uh, you know, we can't say more than really Great thanks to, to Muir Hall and to the community, Nick and, and Chris and everyone else who mentioned over the years to work their way through this, which has very much been a test case, a pilot for an unsubsidized wind farm. Um, there has been shared ownership in uh, uh, just discrete projects over the years, uh, different models and different kind of outcomes, not a standardized approach as such. And I think there are a lot of communities. We're finding a lot of communities. Most communities in their own big wind farms will have some form of organization or perhaps some group of individuals who are particularly and increasingly interested in climate change and decarbonization and community and renewable energy projects. And those are the projects that we try to uh, uh, identify and to work with taking projects forward. So we have that appetite and that understanding, limited as it might be in some communities, to take the project forward with as much sort of gusto as possible to make the thing happen. We have found in the past, of course, and again highlighted by the, uh, the Cross Lakes experience, projects take an awful long time and it can be a really stop start sort of process. <laughs> I see Sarah smiling there. <laughs> we'll know it as much as as much as anyone. And from a community's point of view, um, a project can or a developer can speak to a community about a potential or an opportunity for community shared ownership at the earliest possible share uh, stage, which we all I think ag agree about. But then the, the project disappears into planning potentially for years. So we're hoping we'll benefit from speeding up of the consenting process in all respects, including to keep communities engaged in projects um, and coming out in maybe a couple of years rather than we see some projects disappearing for 10, 15 or more years before the community actually and hanging in for that length of time. So things are getting better, I think. The timing is speeding up. We're hoping to identify, we always aim to identify uh, the most capable, the best placed uh, community organizations, groups and individuals and communities to take these things forward and to engage with their advisors with experience. That's a very niche market I have to add as well. QMPF have the Financial Conduct Authority permissions. There are only very few uh, advisors out there that we're aware of um, who have uh, the ability to provide the advice to communities as non-professional investors in wind farms. So we, we have these resources available. They were developed on the back of, uh, of Muir Hall and uh, their opportunity for uh, shared ownership in Cross Lakes wind farm. So we're very grateful to that. And the whole sector, I think, is grateful for that opportunity and to have the willing developer and the willing community there to work with on this uh, challenging project. So onwards and upwards, and hopefully uh, things are only going to get easier. I don't think that's ever actually happened in this sector, but we'll see what happens in the, in the next few uh, weeks, months and years. Um, I think that's all I just wanted just just to say that we're you know we're aware and we share and we work closely with the stakeholders here and uh, we're hoping you know to uh, address these points and we're working on that uh, to make the shared ownership as easy as possible for communities developers and other stakeholders alike. So I think We've got Gemma back on screen now, my colleague Gemma there, and uh, I think we maybe have a couple of questions, do we, Gemma? We yeah, could... we do. I'm just going to quickly stop recording here and we'll move over to questions and answers. Thanks.